Okay, so um, today you have a couple things that are due. More on that after we get through the lecture. And uh, remember, this is a little, little bit of a challenge today to do things. You're going to have your redos for writing summit number one. I will mark those, get them back to you next Tuesday. You're also going to have your second writing assignment, which is a write-up of your hypothesis and the methods you use by which to test things. I've already had a couple of those things turned in. They are due officially by 5 o'clock today. If you can get them to me earlier today, I can get them back to people. And the rules are here. If you give them to me now, I will give you one to walk away with on the way out of here. Otherwise, you have to come and pick them up from me tomorrow by about 9 o'clock in the morning or sometime early in the morning because they're due tomorrow by 5. I have to get them back from you before the weekend. I need time to mark these and get them back to you Tuesday. That's what I'm talking about with these very, sh very short turnarounds in terms of uh, assignments that are due. Okay, so um, this is one of the ones that's going to be the most uh, annoying in terms of overall timing. This is also the time when I'd like to actually start with getting students to do reviews of previous lectures that we had. And uh, as I said, it's going to be somewhat random in terms of stuff. I have a, an attendance sheet here, and when you do one, I'm checking you off the list. And if we get through all the lectures and all, then you'll be done. So this is kind of like, I'm just going to pick somebody from the class to go over the reviews. And first time is going to be kind of like you don't know what to expect, so I will talk you through it, okay? So um, Jessica, I'm going to get you to do it today, please, if you don't mind. Uh, we're talking today about sedimentary rock classification, but before we do that, what did we do last time? We did these two. Right, this is the, the whole thing we were going to do. We actually, we only did the first two things. So we did six modes of sediment transport and real simple fluid dynamics under ideal conditions. So, can you explain just very briefly what this slide refers to? Okay. Um, we talked about the ways that sediment moves. And the first four are actual movement uh, with contact on the bottom. Okay. And then the second two, uh, they're suspended in whatever fluid they're in. That's a good way. For, you know, I actually wouldn't have coined it quite that way, but you're right. Both of those involve suspension in one way, but what's the difference between true suspension and mass flow? What's viscous flow? Um. <laughs> and by the way, if, if you get called on doing this next time, if you don't know all the... I'll prompt you as much as I can. If you don't know all that, so I'll just do the following. I'll add some more stuff to that. Viscous flow is things that are associated with landslides where the actual mass of the material itself is being supported by the particles in there. Suspension is where you basically have water carrying the particles. And there's that transition. If you remember, there was like six different, or four different types of mass flow. The last one associated with turbidity, uh, density currents, is almost akin to suspension. But the current is being driven by the very suspension of the particles that are in there. That's right? Ooziness. Ooziness, too, yeah. Ooziness is a good variable. We, you know, we need to quantify that in some way. I have a chart of ooziness. How about this one? We talked about stuff that should be in the Okay. All right, everybody, let, uh, Jessica is still summarizing, so let her talk, please. Um, we talked about Stokes' law, which um, basically tells you the settling, like how quickly a particle or what type of particle will settle to the bottom based on its. What's some of the problems with Stokes' law? Um, based on the turbidity or like the... Um, no, not, not problems with the, with, this, with the way the system works, but what's the problem with the formula you see there no, and the variables? It only works with smaller particles. Ultimately, that's ultimately what's going to happen. What, what I was looking for was there's an awful lot of stuff that you have to measure independently. Each one of those variables deals with some attribute that controls how a particle settles through a fluid. And if you have to measure each one of these things, then it gets very cumbersome. In fact, it, it borders on chaos. You can't really quantify these as well as you'd like to do it. Um, but you have to remember, too, that this is a formula that deals with any particle of any material in any fluid. And really, when we're doing grain size analysis and we're doing applied to geology, it can be cut down to this. And why is this a good thing? Because you only have one independent variable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a const, it's not a constant. It's a variable that involves a lot of other things in it. But the thing is, we can more or less make a very important statement that we can measure grain size as it relates to settling velocity, okay? And incidentally, when we were talking about this, again, I'm, I'm trying to coin this in a way that you can understand it as it applies to geology for actual laboratory analysis. But you can use a very similar thing for determining how fast a person will fall out of an airplane when the parachute doesn't open. 
Right. And it also relates to things like some of those old Newtonian experiments. And remember the experiment where you could drop a hundred pounds of feathers and a hundred pound cannon? What is supposed to happen? They more or less fall at the same rate. In reality, that only really works if you're in a vacuum. Because if you are in a fluid, it will be dependent upon things like surface, surface area, which is also kind of factored in here as well. That's the grain size component of stuff, okay? So, the K is the combination of all these things. Okay, so it's just the constant of the... Right, the remember, when, when we talked about this, the only constant technically here is the gravitational settling constant. But that's not even constant. It depends on you, whether, where you are in terms of altitude. Every one of these other things is not a constant. But if you change the parameters so that you're doing it under a very narrow range of operating parameters, geez, that sounds... That's, I just always sound like I'm a physicist now. But the idea is that if you just say, we're going to do it in water, it's going to be pure water, we're only going to look at quartz, and it's always going to be at the same temperature, more or less, then all this stuff can be condensed into this. That's what it comes down to. Okay? Jessica? And then uh, we talked about how Stokes' law only works if it's laminar flow, there's like smaller particles in right. laminar flow, and the impact law works better for coarser grain materials that are in um, turbulent water. Right, because the turbulence is actually changing the way that things would fall. It's not falling ideally anymore. It's actually being influenced by the components and all. That leads ultimately to this. Yeah, and ultimately what this means is that if you're going to do grain size analysis, you need two methods, not one method. So it's either going to be hydrometer and sieve or pipette and sieve. You choose your poison, so to speak, but you're all going to have to do sieving, which really is the worst thing in the world, short of going to the dentist and having all your teeth pulled out of your head. How about this? Actually, I think we just explained that, right? This is what you're doing now. You're doing this in the lab and all, okay? All right, so you're off the hook at least until the end of the semester. Someone else will be on the hook next time around, okay? So basically, it's not, I'm not going to be, as I said, torturing you and all, but I want you to start learning to communicate and explain things. And frankly, the more opportunity we have you to talk to a group, trying to explain things, the better it's going to be. We have a pretty serious agenda today in terms of stuff, because we have to play a little bit of catch up with what we didn't do last time. Uh, we're going to talk about the initiation of sediment movement, um, nasty mathematical relationships, and more useful things. Shields diagram versus Yulsum's diagram. As it turns out, that actually only comprises about maybe five to ten minutes of actual lecturing, okay? Because I don't spend a lot of time talking about it. And then the rest of this, this is what we were going to be doing originally in Tuesday's class, and it basically is going to be uh, continuing on with our idea of how to classify things. We had classified according to grain size. Now we're going to learn to classify according to composition. And the reason why I didn't mind moving this a little bit, and I will do this permanently, is that this stuff really does not occur for things that you have to do until we get to the thin sections. So we have plenty of time before we have to worry about it, but I'm going to give you an exercise next week, a lab exercise that's going to practice, you give you some opportunity to practice your ability to plot in, in uh, basically three dimensions or ternary plots on rock classification. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly today because, you know, you're not really going to be using this until a lot later on in this class. But I do want you to be aware that classification of sediments can be done through the grain size, but also through other means as well. Uh, you may or may not recognize this as a thin section photograph. Uh, reminder, all of you have seen thin sections before. We're going to be spending a good amount of our time in this course looking down a microscope at thin sections in the future. This is a sandstone. Uh, reminder, this is a certain field of view. This is 1.5 millimeters across from end to end. Uh, that's what FOV means. PPL stands for plain polarized light, meaning the polarizer in the top is pulled out. So what you're looking at is just what the grains look like in natural light. Some of you are going to see here that you've not seen previously, you're going to see white bits, that's the grains, but you're also going to see a lot of blue stuff. Sedimentologists traditionally stain porosity. When you make a thin section, you have to make sure that the thin section has no holes in it, so you have to impregnate it with plastic, it's the same plastic we used to mount it on the glass in the first place, so we tend to stain the epoxy so you can see what was whole space within the rock. Okay, Not always, but most of the time we do that. Uh, eventually you will learn, or actually you should probably already know this now, that particle size tells you something about the 
energy of deposition. So when you're doing grain size analysis, you'll be able to say whether it was high currents or low currents based upon the diagrams we just looked at previously. Grain type classification, where you identify what the minerals are, tells you something about the origin of the sediment. Now nobody is going to be able to identify these grains from looking at them like this at this point, that that is quartz, that that is orthoclase. But I will give you tricks when we start doing this in detail where you can learn very quickly to zero in with the composition of what this grain is versus this one here. That's quartz for a number of different reasons and you'll learn what those are a little bit later on. And this down here, that ugly looking grain, this is referred to as a lithic grain. Lithics are literally fragments of rock that contain more than one mineral. And if you think about the origin of a lot of sediment, especially some that's full of quartz, it came from a pre-existing rock. So when it breaks up, some of the rock grains, or so of so the grains from the rock will be pure quartz, some will be pure orthoclase, some will be a combination of those minerals, okay? So you'll have plenty of time to get your feet wet doing this again. In fact, the first thin section you're going to look at are the easiest thin sections on the planet. They are quartz aronite sandstones, and quartz aronite sandstones have what as their dominant grain? Quartz. Yeah. That easy sometimes. If you had a quartz lithic and a quartz grain, that's what you need to look at a microscope for. I mean, I'll show you how they look differently here now, but really, when it comes down to it, it's, it's practice. So you look at thin sections, when you find something that doesn't fit the bill of quartz, flag me or Rachel down and we'll look at it and we'll say, hey, it's this grain. That's how you learn on it, okay? Now here's the problem. We've already introduced the idea that there's a whole, whole bunch of different sediments. There's a whole bunch of different classes of sedimentary rocks. In fact, there's probably, and this is true, there's probably more variety in the sedimentary rocks than any other type of rock on the planet. You've all done igneous and metamorphic petrology. You know that if you start getting a volcano erupting, it can give you a whole bunch of different types of igneous rocks. But a felsic rock is going to be limited to a certain number of minerals. A basic rock, or mafic rock, is going to be limited to a few types of minerals as well. For a sedimentary rock, if you have a basalt, dike sitting on top of a rhyolite, if those things start to weather, you're going to get a fraction, a fragments of whatever minerals happen to be in those two rocks. Where it gets deposited, it could be anything. So we have a real issue here now in terms of classifying all the possible sedimentary rocks. We don't want to have a gazillion different types of sedimentary rock classification schemes. We want as few as possible. So they've got to work for us. So. How do you classify sediments? It can be grain size specific, which is what we're doing in the lab now, or it can be particle type specific. We do have to have some rules. We have to have schemes that work for the majority of the different classes of sedimentary rocks that we're dealing with. We don't have the time in this class in one semester to deal with all of them. But we are going to deal with the most important ones. I'm going to give you as much practice as I can looking at representatives of each of these. These are the ones we're going to be focusing in on. Siliciclastic sedimentary rocks, and again a reminder, these are rocks that are produced from grains that came from silicate rich rocks. They are enriched in things like quartz, feldspar, clays, lithic fragments, micas, anything that's a silicate mineral. And you should now already know, know that some of these minerals like clays are going to be finer grained than things like quartz. We still have to be able to reflect all the variety of grain sizes if we're going to come up with a compositional uh, means by which to name rocks. We also deal with shales and mudstones, not in this class. All right? it's. I mean, we could do it, but I'd rather focus in on things that you're going to be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis out there in the real world. So we don't spend a lot of time with the classification of shales and mudstones, apart from what I'm going to show you in just a minute. I do want you to see volcanoclastic sedimentary rocks. These are rocks that are produced directly from a volcano. They will have fragments of the volcano itself when they blow up. There will be phenocrysts. You remember what phenocrysts are? The crystals that are growing in the magma. There will be bits of the matrix. This would be the stuff that is between the crystals, as well as an awful lot of vitric stuff. When a volcano, especially a felsic one, erupts, the ash that comes out of a volcano is sediment. It looks cool under thin section, by the way. I've got some really, really good, in fact, these are my favorite thin sections of this class. I've got some uh, tufts that are composed of volcanic ash that you will be absolutely impressed with this stunning stuff. 
The carbonate sedimentary rocks are one of the rocks that we're going to spend a lot of time on as well because they are important. 40% of the sedimentary rocks on the planet are carbonates. And there's probably more sedimentary rocks on the planet just about any other type of rock out there, with the exception of granite. And granites are boring, as we all know. Carbonate rocks also contain a wide variety of grains, skeletal grains, non-skeletal grains, matrix, etc. And lastly, organic sedimentary rocks. Again, we don't spend any time at all studying about these things, in part because the only way to classify them was to use reflected light. And up until recently, we did not have a reflected light microscope. So our class will focus in on these, 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 and maybe one or two other things that are out there. Mostly divisions of these things, okay? How does it work? Well, let me show you some of the schemes that are being used for the siliciclastic rocks, the first things we're going to be dealing with. The problem with siliciclastic rocks is that we have any possible of silicate mineral that can make up a composition of these rocks. It can be quartz, any one of the feldspars, clays, mica, and there's a bunch of different micas. You can have glauconite in there, you can have amphibole, you can have peroxine, you name a silicate mineral, it can be in there. We can't do all of the minerals. Traditionally, what we do is to look at the most important grains in terms of the silicate minerals in general. Those grains are as follows. One, quartz. Two, the feldspars. And I don't think I have to remind everybody that there's more than one feldspar, okay? There's the calcium rich ends, the plagioclase, all the different minerals. Then there are the rock fragments. Otherwise known as lithic grains. These three grains are the ones we almost exclusively use for classifying silicic sedimentary rocks. We often refer to these as QFR diagrams. The Q represents the quartz, the F, the feldspars, and the R component is the rock fragments. Now, if you look at classification, this is something we've been doing for a long, 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 long time. And if there's a problem, and there are lots of problems in geology, lots of problems in sedimentary geology, a lot of people came up with classification schemes about the same time. Here, notice again the dates here, 55, 57. Again, we're in that interval of time where a lot of classification is being done. Everybody had their own reasons for proposing certain schemes. And to this day, we still get people that propose new schemes. The one that I'm most familiar with, I was asked to review a paper back in 1993, I think it was, of a new classification scheme that was being proposed for sedimentary rocks in New Zealand. In this area of New Zealand, there was a lot of glauconite. And the author admirably argued that I can't classify the rocks using the existing schemes. I need to propose a new glauconite scheme. We should all adopt a scheme. I and everybody else who looked at the paper rejected it. Because what happened was, you're getting too specific. Something that works in one area of the world may not translate somewhere else. You don't want to get to the point where you have too much variety. You want to get to the point where you all agree and modify it later on. Case in point, if you've got a lot of glauconite in your sand, if you've got a lot of glauconite but it still has a lot of quartz in it, call it what these guys recommend but modify by calling it a glauconitic quartz aronite sandstone. You see the point? You can modify it any way you want to, but starting to muck up the scheme is a problem. Still, we have a lot of schemes. Here's two of them, here's two more. McBrides and Folk. Hey, remember the name, Folk? He's one of our demigods. Any one of these schemes will work, but we have to agree to something that is consistent. So, in this class, Folk gets the seal of approval. Okay, we're going to use this one. And the reason why we're going to use this one is simply because it's the one I used. All right, so I used it, you used it. I figure if the people who taught me, who were you know, world-class sedimentologists, thought this was the best one, there must have been a reason for it. Please note, all of these rocks, sandstones, are ultimately called aronites. Aronites, as you'll see in a second, are sand-rich siliciclastic sedimentary rocks. Speaking of which, all we're doing so far is talking about grain composition. All right, so we got quartz, we got feldspar, we got rock fragments. But what about the other variable in here? What about grain size? How do you deal with grain size in a situation like that? That's a fourth variable. Now, it's very hard to put three variables on a chart. 
let alone four variables. And frankly, the only way that we can effectively do it is the fourth dimension. This is one approach to doing it. It's not something that can be done easily, but it's really kind of a cool nonetheless. What you're looking at here now is the Q, F, R components. By the way, this is not folks diagram. I don't have one that shows folks diagram. It shows the QFR components in this dimension, but in the, this dimension, it shows you the percentage of mud to grains. So it's kind of cool if you understand it. This diagram here is the diagram we use for anything that contains more than 75% fine grain mud matrix. Notice it's called mudstone. Remember I told you we don't really classify shales? That's shale mudstone. So if you have something that's got 75% mud in it, it's a shale. I love this classification scheme. It plots anywhere in here, you know what it is. The one in between is from 15 to 75 percent mud matrix. These are called wackies. Where have you heard that term before? Gray wackies. Gray Remember the definition of a gray wacky it was a dirty sandstone? Well, that's because that type of sandstone had more than 15% mud matrix in it. And by the way, you can subdivide these into quartz wackies, if most of the grains are quartz, into lithic wackies or felspathic wackies. You can do that subdivision if that's what you really want to do. And then, of course, these triangles deal with the aronites. Aronites are sandstones that have less than 15% mud within them. And this version would call it feldspathic aronite versus lithic aronite, etc. That's not the one we're using. We're using the one that was before, okay? We're not going to worry about any of these. We're going to concentrate on the sandstones because, again, part of, the, part of my goal in this class is to get you to understand how to recognize things in thin section as well as what it means in thin section. No sense spending a lot of time looking at mud because that's hard to actually identify. Right here, plots, composition, and size. But the composition has to be limited to only three important ingredients, okay? So yeah, that does it. But again, it's only for graphically representing these things. So if you had, like, 90% quartz, but it was just super, super fine. It would plot as a mudstone. If there was more than 15% mud in it, yeah. Okay. All right. And if it was less than 15% mud, it would plot here. Okay. So it's not like we have intervening classification things between them. These are cutoffs. Okay. You have more than 15%, use that one. You have more than 75%, use that one. That's, that's how this works, okay? It's not something you take in the field with you. All right, so here is what we're going to be doing. We're going to use QFR diagrams, and I use RLs through here. Some conventions. Quartz is quartz. Sometimes people put chert in with quartz. If you remember, chert is microcrystalline silica. Most of the time, however, and this is what we're going to do, we classify it as a rock fragment because almost every type of chert on the planet is an alteration of a limestone. So if you see a fragment of chert, it's an altered limestone. If it's an altered limestone, it's part of a rock, hence it's a rock fragment, okay? The feldspars, we're going to group all the orthoclase and plagioclase together. Although there are some divisions where they actually separate those things out as well. As I said, you can go into a lot of extremes here if you want to. But this is what we're going to do for our classifications. I want to make sure everyone's clear on what these rock fragments are, okay? So I want you now to envision. We have a source of sediment. That's pink granite mountain here. Stone Mountain or whatever you, out in the rocky somewhere. And there is a sediment apron, okay? So there is where sediment is being deposited. If you were to make a thin section from the granite, this is possibly what you would see. So what you're looking at now is the grains that make up a granite. Everybody here should be able to identify immediately what those grains are. The pink stuff is what? Which one? Potassium. Potassium, microcline, probably, okay, or orthoclase. The white stuff is probably? Ores. No. Uh, sodium plagioclase. Sodium thank you. So it's going to be probably the north site area. The, the gray area you see through here is going to be? probably quartz, and the black stuff is going to be biotite or hornblende or something like that, okay? So assuming now that that is feldspar, if that grain were to break up and weather exclusively, you'd have a 100% chunk of feldspar, it's going to be an F grain. There's a quartz grain, apparently, all right? That breaks up and is 100% quartz, you have yourself a Q grain. What's a rock fragment? 
A rock fragment is a chunk of material that has more than one grain within it. And in some cases, some rocks, you can actually see a grain which has a little bit of orthoclase in it, a little bit of quartz in it, a little bit of biotite in it. What kind of grain is it? It's a chunk of granite. You can recognize what the rock was on the basis of the composition of one grain. Yeah. So you won't see the void space in a rock fragment where you go between, say, the Q and the There are some rock fragments that will have void space in them. I've seen chunks of limestone, say, that has a fragment of a foraminifera in it and maybe something else where there's still pore space within the foraminifera. What the rock fragments are showing you is what the original rock was. And I'll tell you, that's incredibly good at determining the source of sediment. If you find a sandstone down here, which has got a chunk of granite, a granite rock fragment in it, you know the source of the rock was going to be granite. It has also been used to determine where sources of sediment have come from. It's called provenance. And you may find a rock here that has grains in it that are absolutely diagnostic of, a, uh, say, a diabase dike. And the nearest diabase dike to that outcrop might be 100 kilometers away. There's a good chance that that was the source of the sediment. We've used that in the past to determine that currents might have flowed 180 degrees from what they are flowing today in the past. All right? Provenance determination is important. All right, so that's what we're going to be doing. Now, I'm very quickly going to go through some of the other classification schemes we have here now because I only have a couple minutes left before I turn you loose into the lab where you guys go track down Dr. Allison. And he takes bribes. He's actually cheaper than I am. If you want to get an, uh, any consideration from me, stapling $50 bills to your assignments is what you want to do. Allison will do it for 20 bucks. Now, he's paying off a trailer or something. I don't know. Oh, God, I'm recording this. I was just kidding. I, you know, a lot of people watch this from India, and I'm, I, I don't need people to start sending me money saying, please help me with my assignments. This is the scheme we use for volcanoclastic sedimentary rocks. It's going to be different because volcanoclastic sedimentary rocks don't have necessarily quartz, feldspar, and stuff in them. Instead, what they've got are rock fragments, the remains of the volcano that may or may not have blown up. They've got glass fragments, the pumice, the vitric component, the glassy component, and then they've got the phenocris. All right, so this is one scheme that has been proposed. And by the way, um, when you get to the volcanic classic rocks, please note that there's no such thing as a lithic. All of these require, these are just the adjectives for them. This is actually a lithic tuff versus a lithic vitric tuff versus a lithic crystal tuff. They're all tuffs because by definition, a tuff is a rock that is produced from particulate material from a volcano. The carbonates. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now because we're not going to be dealing with the carbonates for several weeks, and you'll get this again later on, but I don't want to leave you hanging. The carbonates are different from the siliciclastic rocks because carbonates are composed of what mineral? Limestone. Well, limestone's a rock. They're composed of what? Calcium carbonate is a chemical composition. They're composed of calcite and a couple of, and aragonite and a couple others. Now, you could use calcite, aragonite, and maybe magnesium calcite to classify limestones, but it's irrelevant because you may have a bunch of shells, say clam shells, that are composed of aragonite and a bunch of clam shells that are composed of calcite. What's it telling you? Far better to actually look at the shapes and sizes of the particles. This is a scheme that uses grain size more than it does composition to determine what the rocks are. Now this is folks classification scheme and once again we have multiple schemes and while it may seem like I'm a folk fan, and I am for the most part, we're not using this one. When it comes to carbonates, we're going to use this one here. Okay. Now don't worry about any of the classifications that you see here. Okay? We're going to go into some detail about it. But I will say it's done on the basis of grains to matrix. A rock that has got less than 10% grains, that's a carbon, is called a mudstone. Where have you heard that term before? Just a few minutes ago, right? We said that if you have a silicic classic rock that's got mostly fine grain stuff, we call it a mudstone. This scheme uses as much as possible analogies with the silicic classic ones. So a mudstone here, dealing with carbonates, is a rock that's composed mostly of fine grain stuff. Something that's got more than 10% grains, but less than about 30% grains is called a wacky stone. Where does the term wacky come from? Again, silica classic components. By the way, wacky stone is universally accepted as a carbonate. So don't start confusing where you apply these things. These two here are not 
directly analogous to anything we have in Swiss classics. Pack stones and grain stones, they are rocks that contain mostly grains. The difference is a pack stone has mud in between the grain contacts. Again, kind of overlapping with a wacky stone. The grain stones would be synonymous with aronites. Float stones and rud stones, grains greater than the two millimeters in size. What do we call a sediment that is greater than two millimeters in size in those classic rocks? Gravel. What kind of rocks do you get if you're dealing with gravel-sized particles that are silicosic? Conglomerates or breccias, depending upon whether they're angular or not. Okay, and then so we have this stuff here. Okay, so just to summarize. These are equivalent to sandstones and mudstones in silicosic rocks. These are equivalent to conglomerates in silicosic schemes. These have no equivalence because the thing about carbonates that make them so unique, they are produced from organisms. And in some cases, the organisms are growing as the sediment is being deposited. These things all have to deal with organisms that are influencing the sediment around them. All right. Oh, perfect timing for once in my life. Uh, it gives us enough time now actually to make sure that everyone is aware of what you're responsible for here, okay? Writing assignment number two is due today by five o'clock. If you've got it with you now, give it to me now and I will redistribute them. Remember, this is the first thing that you're going to be doing for peer review. The peer review forms are in the package of stuff I gave you before. If you've already lost your peer review, forms, if you lost your packages, go online and get them. Your writing assignment number one redo is due today as well. If you want to redo it, give it to me. Make sure you give me the redo as well as the previous one marked up so I can make sure that you made the corrections. Uh, your peer review assignment is due tomorrow by 5 o'clock. Now here's where this, the faster you are in this, the better it's going to be for you. If you get me an assignment today, there's a good chance I will give you one for peer review before you leave lab today at 2 o'clock. If you don't get it to me, if you wait until 5 o'clock, I will grab them all. I will be here 8 o'clock in the morning. You need to come and see me as early in the morning as possible and I will give you an assignment because that peer review has got to be due by 5 o'clock Friday. So it's due tomorrow. Okay? Uh, you're going to have a lab next week on ternary plots. That will be due next Thursday. It's in your package already. All it is is just talking about how to classify grain size and compositional variation on those ternary plots. Some of those calculations are a little bit, shall we say, require a little bit of thinking. Maybe not so much as Dr. Allison's structural geology things, but you may have to think about them a little bit. And there's one package of stuff in there that deals with statistical analysis. Remember those formulas I gave you a while ago? There's some questions on that as well. In lab today, grain size analysis. There is a group that has stuff in the columns ready to go. That consists of Jessica, Mary, Bo, and Matt. Matt S. Okay? Your stuff was put in last night. The people that are going to be doing this tomorrow, your stuff's in the shaker. So it's going to be up to the people doing the analysis today to take your bottles and put them in the shaker. So everyone's got to coordinate in terms of time here a little bit. I noticed that there's nobody getting set up for Saturday, I think. So we have some gaps in time. I did a count. I think we're okay with everybody scheduling except for one group, which I believe is the Jennifers, right? You guys haven't scheduled analysis time yet, have you? Oh, uh, we're... Okay, make sure that you've signed up for a time, okay? Everybody needs to be booked up between now and the end of next week. Because once you do your analysis, you still have to do the interpretations. And remember, you need the data by which to do the analysis, okay? Next time we meet, bed form development, which we're going to start introducing things like the flume, okay? I'm going to put a pot of coffee on in a minute. I'm going to go get some cookies because we're in lab mode, which means now we need to enjoy ourselves. If you've got your assignments, bring them up. There's two piles. Pile number, this one is the redos. This one is the hypothesis. So write one's here, write two is there. What did you give me?